Good afternoon to all. Boa tarde. Bem-vindos. Welcome to the Colloquium on Inequalities, Poverty, Racism and Social Mobility in Brazil. My name is Marcelo Medeiros and I am a researcher at the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. Our conversation today is organized in partnership with the Graduate Program in Social Anthropology of the Museu, Museu Nacional in Rio. I also would like to thank our on-campus co-sponsors, the Program of Latin American Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Department of Anthropology. We have with us today two outstanding Brazilian scholars. Marcia Lima, she is a professor of sociology at the University of Sao Paulo and senior researcher at the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, SEBRAP, where she coordinates the Afro Center for Research and Training in Race, Gender and Racial Justice. A leading public intellectual, Lima studies racial inequality and racial relations with a focus on gender, education, labor market and affirmative policies. Pedro Souza is a sociologist and senior researcher at the Brazilian Institute for Applied Economic Research, IPEA. Souza is the author of A History of Inequality, Income Concentration Among the Rich in Brazil, for which he won three important prizes, among them the Jabuti Prize for the Best Brazilian Book of 2019. It's a great pleasure to have you, Pedro and Marcia, participating on this online discussion. We look forward to hearing your insights and learning from uh, your scholarship and public engagement. Our format today is the following. Pedro will start with a presentation of some 15 to 20 minutes. Marcia will follow. After their talks, we will open the floor for questions and comments for the audience. And we're gonna be collecting those questions in, uh, from uh, YouTube. For you watching from home, the chat on YouTube channel is already open, so please feel free to join in the conversation. Our team will be collecting questions and comments from the chat and will forward them to me and I will forward them to our guests. So I would like to ask Pedro to begin with his presentation. Pedro, if you could, please. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, for your kind words. Let me share my screen first. Let's see, oh, I think this is it. So, well, hi everybody. It's a shame I can't see you, but uh, hello, it's good evening, actually, it's, it's past six here. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here with Marcelo. Marcelo is a longtime friend. He was my advisor during my, my PhD. Uh, I have to thank him for a lot in, in life, but still. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my research on, on the long-run evolution of income inequality in Brazil. I've been working on this for, for quite a while now. Uh, I think it's a fascinating topic in and of itself, but it also ties in with a lot of great empirical work that's been, uh, it's been done recently on, on the economic history of Latin America. And of course, it's also related to uh, some quite heated controversies in the social sciences more, more generally, namely on the causes and, and determinants of inequality in the long run. So let me see. Okay. okay. So I did my, my PhD dissertation on this, as Marcelo briefly mentioned. As I said, he was my advisor. It was then published as, as a book. But the, the figures I'm going to show you today are mostly from this latest iteration of the research that I'm doing uh, with Mark Morgan from the, the Paris School of Economics. It's still ongoing. The, the, the figures are not final, but they are very consistent at this point. And actually, the, the, most of the conclusions from my book still hold, so, so I'm pretty confident in them, but it's still ongoing research. So I'm, I'm not going to get too much into the details and technicalities. We can talk about that later if anyone wants to, to hear about that kind of thing. But what we're doing really, we're using the so-called distributional national accounts framework to combine uh, in a rigorous manner uh, household surveys when available, income tax tabulations, and other data sources uh, to reconcile them and maybe get a, a, a comparable and consistent and coherent long time uh, series on, on income inequality in Brazil, especially top income shares. Right? Doing, by doing so, we hope to be addressing the main shortcomings of each, of each data source, 
uh, household surveys in particular are known for, for underestimating the, the incomes of the, the very rich, of even the not so rich, but still uh, quite rich. So by, you, by combining these different sources and, and doing so in a, in a rigorous manner, we expect to, to provide better estimates than what we had before. Though even, I mean, 10 years ago or so, we, we had no estimates really for the long run. So I think we've come a long way in the past few years and we hope we'll keep advancing uh, over the next decade or so. And obviously uh, 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 the main point of this exercise is to have figures that are uh, coherent with national income aggregates like the system of national accounts. So we're, going to, we're improving comparability with other countries too, which is important in this kind of research. So as a setup, I just start, wanted to start by show you something you, you might be familiar with. Uh, this plot, this graph just plots growth rates, annual growth rates in national income per adult in Brazil since the 20s. The shaded areas denote both dictatorships we had over the past century. And the, the black line is just a, a 10 year moving average, just you know, to have the feeling of, of change. I mean, honestly, Based on this figure, before I faced any of the empirical data on the distribution of income, I expected this to be reflected in inequality trends, to, to, to some extent at least, right? Because up until the late 70s, Brazil had quite fast income growth. Uh, of course, it was exceptionally fast during the, the so-called Brazilian miracle. But it was a period where, as a late industrializing country, Brazil was, well, actually industrializing at a rapid pace and also urbanizing quickly. And the country was changing completely from a from mostly agrarian to a mostly urban uh, society. And then in the late 70s, around 1980, after the oil shocks and well, a good dose of uh, economic mismanagement, uh, we entered a new phase of very slow growth and deindustrialization and, well, severe uh, recessions. And except for a brief moment in the early 2000s, uh, growth was really either negative or, or zero. So national income per adult is actually today uh, at, at about the same level as it was in the early 80s. Though, if you look at per capita figures, they're, they're, they're more optimistic because we, we, we're undergoing a demographic transition. So there's less children around, but uh, productivity gains have been really uh, non-existent over the past 30 years. And I expected to see this reflected somehow in inequality patterns, but actually we don't see it. We don't see it at all. I mean, I have the, the top 1% income share over most of the century. There are, this is for two different income concepts. Fiscal income is, is pretty much what we'd consider uh, monetary income, right? And national income is a broader measure, but they tell pretty much the same story, right? Uh, you can't see really any obvious effect of structural change here or you know, changes in education or human capital, but you do see a very close correlation with changes in what we can we may call the political cycle, or uh, it's it's amazing how how sudden changes in inequality track down very closely sudden changes in political institutions. So, for for starters, during the first dictatorship, the Vargas Stadunov dictatorship, especially during World War II, we had a very quick surge in inequality, and then as the war was nearing its end, inequality kind of dropped to get back to its its level, its pre-war level. And that, that has a lot to do with both the internal uh, political system and the external conditions caused by the war. Then a quite surprising fall in inequality, especially during the 50s. Not many people wrote about this. There's other kinds of evidence that suggests this fall is real. But anyways, uh, most of the literature considered this period of the so-called import substitution industrialization to be a period where inequality increased. This is not the case, at least for the top 1%. And then another turning point, uh, just around the, the 1964 military coup, right? And then inequality surged following the early rounds of reform the, the, the military imposed on, on Brazil. And it, it's worth noting that inequality surged before the so-called Brazilian miracle. So it's not really a, a benign history of the race between you know, industrialization and education, as some scholars back then put it. Uh, it's something that other people said that like Albert Fischler and others that had a lot to do with the, the policy choices of the, of the military uh, dictatorship early on. That's, that's my view, at least. Then in 
kind of, kind of, the picture becomes more muddled, really, because uh, as we neared the end of the dictatorship, inflation took off and accelerated sharply. Inequality seems to have increased, but there's a lot of noise in the data, depending on, on how high inflation was. So it's it's hard to, to be sure of, of the trends, but it's, it seems that inequality surely increased. Then macroeconomic stabilization came and inequality probably lowered by quite a bit. Maybe some of that drop is artificial. We don't know, we probably never know, but it certainly had some real effect and it's been creeping back up uh, ever since the mid to late 90s, really. And that's also uh, completely contrary to what we see in household surveys. And that's a very robust finding, actually. I've been working with Marcelo on this for quite a while. We tried a bunch of different techniques and uh, this finding holds up very, very well, actually. It's, it's, it seems that at, at the very worst, inequality was stable, or the concentration of income at the top was stable, but it more likely it rose a little bit during the 2000s. And this, this picture is just to compare Brazil and put it, our series in some context in case you're not familiar with it. So there's the USA, France, and Japan. Uh, there's just three points I, I, I want to I single out into this slide before moving on to the next. First, uh, as Jeffrey Williamson has discussed very controversially recently, he's been saying that income inequality in Latin America was not so different from income inequality in Europe up until the early 20th century. So, you know, the common sense, the common wisdom that says that, uh, you know, the colonial legacy and the slavery and the colonial past more generally are to blame for, for the high levels of inequality in Latin America. William says that's not quite so because Latin America was, was very unequal, but so was Europe. We just missed the, the so-called 20th century leveling. And there's some, some, he has a point there, I think. I think there are several caveats and, and nuances and qualifications we need to introduce. But the data seem to support a little bit. I think this needs to be investigated further. That's something I, I intend on doing. But there's, there's, I think we need to enrich in our, our understanding of, this, of the past and of the colonial legacy in Latin America. Uh, based on this data, which is obviously incomplete and not ideal for, for this. Also, I want to I wanna call attention to the fact that the, the massive drop in inequality during World War II, this is very well documented in most of Europe and several other countries. So it's not only in Brazil that inequality tends to change amidst political crisis very quickly. Uh, that's mostly true in, in, in other countries as well. And obviously, the, the USA stand, it stands out for the recent decades, uh, the USA seems to be trying uh, really hard to catch up with Brazil, though we, we still got quite a lead on them. And this finally is just like a cross section of the top 1% income share and national income per capita. I just wanted to show you that uh, there's, a, there's a lots of measurement error in this kind of estimate, but it, it kind of holds. Uh, statistically speaking, uh, you have a sort of like the, the most common case is that countries the top 1% tend to amass or, or to, to get up to up to 15% of income. This is kind of arbitrary cutoff, but it's it's illustrative, I guess. So you, you see countries of all kinds there, they're color coded according to regions. Uh, you have most of Europe, the former social socialist countries, so even some uh, North African and Middle Eastern countries, and of course, lots of Asian and, and African countries there. And they're, they range from very poor countries like Mauritania to Norway, which is very rich. You also have a second tier uh, of countries that's more, then it's mostly uh, outside of Europe, but, and then Latin American countries make an appearance. The US is there too, uh, where income inequality ranges from, at least the concentration of income at the top ranges from 15 to 25%. And then you have the real outliers, even, even giving some room for measurement error. It's, it's clear those countries are outliers and Brazil is amongst them. So we see all this, those changes and those fluctuations. And at the, at the same time, we don't see any long-term trend towards lower inequality. And inequality in Brazil remains at an incredibly high level. And of course, there's Qatar, uh, which is the, the richest country in the sample, also very unequal. And then three African countries, it's the Central African Republic, Malawi, and Mozambique, which are the three that lead the, the, the sample. I just wanted to illustrate how unequal Brazil is and how impossible it is to just relate this either in the cross section or in the time series to any kind of uh, benign Kuznets style uh, uh, development trajectory. So modernization theory should just be abandoned at this point, I guess. 
And since I, I thought this, this presentation was getting incredibly bleak, because it seems like nothing ever changes and inequality rises and fall, but falls, but still hovers around a very high level. I wanted to show you that there was some change in Brazil in the past few decades. And, and that's, that concerns mostly the bottom, the poorest half of the population, the bottom 50% income share. Once you zoom in on that, on that population, you'll see that their income share has actually increased quite a bit. It's very, very low. But when compared to the 80s, and especially the late 80s, which were a low point, uh, the, the poor have increased their, their share of the, of the pie, so to speak. So of course, if both the poor and the rich are doing reasonably well, or if they're increasing in relative terms, it's the middle that's being squeezed out. I feel, I feel kind of bad saying it's the middle because I'm, most, I'm talking really about half of the population, those above the median and just below the top 1%. But those are the, the losers, so to speak, of the new republic, of, of the post-redemocratization regime. Uh, those are the, the, the guys who, who lost, the, in relative terms at least, uh, quite a bit of vis-a-vis of, of, -vis the, the poorest and, and the rich. So this is, this is, it's, it's impossible to say how, how things are going to play out in, in the next few years. We have some preliminary information that suggests that the poor actually were the hardest hit by the recession uh, of 2014 and 16, and also by the, the current pandemic. So this picture might uh, uh, be different in a few years when we update it. And also the, let's say the political equilibrium that sustained the, the new Republic and the post stabilization era has also changed dramatically. So it's hard to say how, how this is gonna play out. So just to conclude, and I think I'm going to be on time here, uh, I wanted to stress that really top shares really seem uh, very closely tied to political development, especially to disruption in times of crisis. This is not only in Brazil, this is uh, elsewhere as well, as I tried to show very quickly. Brazil remains very, very, very unequal by any standard, even if you just look at Gini coefficients and even just at the household surveys, Brazil is very, uh, uh, is always amongst the most unequal countries. And this kind of redistribution from the middle or to, to the bottom without ever touching the, the, the or, or changing the, the share of the rich, it clearly has run its course or it seems to have run its course both in political terms, but also uh, it's hard to, to lower inequality dramatically if you're not you know, uh, changing the income share of those of that 1% of the population who controls almost 30% of, of national income. So uh, if you want to think about reform, you really want to think about redistribution from the top. And in terms of broader debates, and just, you know, I'm going to need just another minute. Uh, I've been mulling over this idea a lot, and a lot of people have written uh, extensively on this, and I think this is a very promising field, is that inequality is very resilient. And I think you can uh, rely on, uh, on literature from political science and sociology and economics to explain this. Uh, and it seems to change quickly and during times of crisis, catastrophes, as, as Walter Scheidel from Stanford University said it. Uh, and I, I, I'm trying to understand and figure out exactly why this happens. And it's clear that times of crisis often uh, open up brief windows of opportunity for, for all encompassing that when, you know, a dictatorship takes over and we see that at specific junctures in time, like during world wars and, and such. And of course, the upshot, of the, the, the other side of this is that uh, structural change in human capital do not seem to explain much, at least when it comes to top income shares. Uh, of course, they are important in and of themselves. And, and of course, they do have an influence on inequality. But in this case, they don't seem that useful. And really, in the case of Brazil, at least, we need uh, more data dating back to the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and maybe even earlier than that, to address more uh, uh, specifically Jeffrey, Jeffrey Williamson's hypothesis on the, the roots of Latin American inequality. And I think that's something that we're gonna be seeing a lot of, of papers and great work on this on the, over the next few years. And well, so that's it. I'm, I'm looking forward for questions, the debate, and of course, my colleague Marcia's presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pedro. It was a very interesting presentation. So. Uh, I would like to ask Marcia to, to make her presentation so we can move later on uh, for questions. And I would like to remind everybody watching from home that uh, we are taking questions on YouTube.
Okay, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Brazil Lab. It's a great honor to be here today, especially with Pedro. Um, I've decided to present today a discussion and the results based on my newest project, a preliminary result, actually, racial inequality and COVID-19. But before talking about this project, uh, I want to highlight some important issues considering the context and of the racial debate in Brazil today. And nowadays it's common in Brazil, in the Brazilian public debate to claim that inequalities became more visible in the pandemic or the pandemic revealed the Brazilian inequality. Maybe to the audience that sounds like a joke. For me, it sounds like a joke. Uh, but we should recognize that there is something new today. Maybe in the beginning, it's very important, in the beginning of the pandemic, we had more space to talk about inequality. I perceive more interesting to listen to about inequality in Brazil. Uh, since 2014, especially the second term of the Dilma Rousseff government, and especially since 2018, after the election of Jair Bolsonaro, Brazil has faced a new phase of the race relations. And this new moment, I, in my opinion, is related to two points, two situations. The first one is the increase of racial mobilization, result of historical demands, but also due to affirmative action policies and other social policies promoted uh, public debate about race, gender, sexuality, also, it's introduced a new generation of political actors in different spaces that use it to be very exclusive and very, very discrimination spaces, such as uh, Black Youth and the Brazilian University, and also the media spaces in Brazil. And the second situation, I think, change in Brazil, uh, it's a very important to understand this moment now, and the recent reduction of this social and racial policies, especially the face of the new economic crisis. Even before the pandemic, racial inequality and poverty were already growing. According to the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, Brazil and Venezuela are currently the countries that most contribute to the growth of poverty in Latin America. That's ironic. This, this change the, <laughs> led to a stronger political mobilization. So, in my opinion, that the context with the debate of on inequalities at COVID-19 was established. More inequalities, less public policies, and more political mobilization, especially the Black movement. The Black, the Black movement Brazil was responsible for the first data about race and COVID-19 in Brazil. So, uh, uh, um, I'm going to show you back to the, the, the project. This project is an amazing project. And I have a wonderful team work with me. And I'd like to thank you to Ana Venturini, Caio Jardim, Hugo Barbosa, Gisele Costa, Jaciane Milanese, Renata Braga, and Tyler Bicalho. And thanks to Ford Foundation for supporting this project. Um, Its proposal uh, is to contribute to the public debate on how the new coronavirus affects the black population. Our product will be a series of newsletters on several topics such as what did the pandemic find in Brazil, inequality of mobility and access to health, education, labor market, the portrait of racial inequality in the municipalities most affected by COVID-19, the racial distribution of the infection, the price of population and COVID, quilombolas communities, black women in the pandemic, especially the case of, sorry, especially the case of community health agents, and the role of the civil society in tackling the pandemic in the peripheries, and the, the analysis of the excess of deaths. 
Also, we have amazing partners. The Solidary Research Network is University of Sao Paulo and Brazilian Center of Analysis and Planning. Um, the Abrasco, and especially the Health and uh, Race in the Health Group, the Brazilian Association of Public Health. Uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Getúlio Vargas Foundation, the Bureaucracy Study Center, Federal University of Minas Gerais, Vital Strategy, CONAC, the Quilombolas Communities Coordination, and the Infovirus, a special, uh, they have a special network to collect data about the present population. Um, we said the selection of these subjects was made considering the dimension that we consider crucial to understand the primary markers that make the pandemic an intersectional phenomenon, especially race, gender, and territory. We start to publish this newsletter at the end of this month on the CBREX website. Um, so the first question I think it's very, very important to answer is what did the pandemic find in Brazil? This question is crucial to, to understand the racial inequalities and COVID-19 because its answer helps to explain the next one, how these NICO conditions affects the available resources and the chances to survive during the pandemic. So inequalities must be understood as a relational phenomenon. Its durability is related to unequal categories of people, lessons from Charles Chile. Inequalities are not limited to income aspects, lessons from Amartya Sen and others. And also there are multidimensional inequality as Gordon Tebbel suggests have a three primary dimensions. And we are trying to work with these dimensions in this project. And vital inequalities like health and longevity in COVID is about vital inequalities, but not only vital inequalities. Uh, the material inequalities, especially the uh, inequalities of opportunities related to access to goods, products, and resources. In Brazil case, the COVID-19 material inequalities emphasize the territorial segregation, regional disparities, race and gender, especially race and gender. And also there is a very specific question about the idea of inequality of recognition. Humans unequal treatment of persons with the, the denial of equal recognition and respect for the different groups. We, I'm, here I'm talking about, specifically about the prison population and about quilombolas and native people, indigenous people in Brazil. The situation of this group during the pandemic is very, very, uh, very, very precarious. And I, our, our group, uh, we understand this more than inequality of recognition as uh, in terms of the human with unequal treatment during the pandemic. So the COVID-19 put all these dimensions together to produce, but also to reproduce inequalities during the pandemic. And I don't have much time to address all these questions during this presentation. So I select some, some points. We have a lot of data in this project. I select some, some of them to show, show today. And the first one, I think we have to understand in the, the Brazilian map in terms of the black population, okay? So we have here uh, two maps about the this black, black and black, black and pardo distribution, because we can use in English the, the, the word Negro. So the no white population, but no whites, no, you don't include, didn't, don't include um, no white in this map doesn't include indigenous. So it's black and brown together. We put together black and brown, but that's the, the, this map. The first one is um, the, represent the, the distribution of the black and brown in Brazil. So you can see 
that's distribution and considering the north and northeast more black and brown, more, more black population considered the end, the south and the southeast when you have more white people. But there is another way to look at this. And when we consider the idea of the racial density now, and when the racial group that constitute a simple minority of the population. So that's orange here, it's black and brown, more black and brown, more white and known. And we have no racial density. That's very interesting because in Brazil, as considered a country without, without no racial segregation, but we have few areas in Brazil with, without racial density. So very interesting. And the areas and you have more black and browns, dense, racial density with black and browns who have more, uh, the, 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 situa the economic situation is worst as everybody knows, but it's, and considering this, this specific situation COVID, the, the data about health conditions is, is worse too. So nobody's, I think until today, until, until the pandemic situation, except the people who work on health inequality, nobody knows about this inequalities um, on health. So it's a very interesting when you look at this data consider this, this, this data about health and racial inequality on health, you can figure it out now how, how profound our, uh, our inequality on health in Brazil. And the effect of this, this picture is very important to understand uh, the, uh, the effect of this in another, uh, in another situation. So, we're gonna look at, for example, let's start with a summary indicator like, like H, Human Development Index, for example. Uh, so I'd like to stress out this. We can't understand racial inequality in Brazil without understanding racial, regional inequality. But regional inequality in Brazil is not a coincidence, is not, um, a destiny of faith that regional inequalities in Brazil is a result of racial discrimination. It's a very, very important to stress out this. And so you have uh, racial differentials in black and white, considering the human development in index beyond means. So here, the most important information we have is the black population took 10 years, you have two, 2000, 2010, uh, by the census 2010-2010, if we look at here and the HDI for the black population 2010, and is the same of the HDI for the white people in 2000. So the black population took 10 years to reach the same index as the white people. In 2010, they still have a considerable difference considering the income here, and also some for older oldest people you have in the education level, we still have a significant difference for between white, white and black people. And for elementary school, the, the difference are, are lower, but if you look at for 18 or more in this for the older people, we still have uh, considering racial inequalities in Brazil. So that's the idea when you look at this data is considering what did the pandemic find in Brazil in terms of inequality. So there is a very important question in the debate uh, during the pandemic. It's about the distance learning in Brazil. So I'm going to show you uh, some data about uh, a very important resource to learning distance in Brazil. So we have the proportion of elementary and high school students in the public system without access to a computer with internet. Uh, and here we, we have the same map about race and region, just about 
the access to computer with internet. So the same regional inequality, but it's not about race anymore, but it's about race. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very, very unequal, the access to computer with internet. Uh, we can see a subsistence regional inequality with effects on racial disparities, especially in the North and Northeast. But you can say, but okay, access to computer with internet is a very, very specific and very, very, this, this, but the best conditions to distance learning is computer with internet. So let's look at the proportion of elementary and middle school students with in the public system again without access to cell phone with the internet. Not the best way to learn for distance learning is we have to, to attend a class in the pandemic with the cell phone, but even with the people have the cell phone, the, the numbers are better. Yeah? It's very different if you have 90% of the students without computer to 34%, but still the inequality is, is higher, it's still higher. So the regional inequality is still uh, uh, strong here. Yeah. So that's, this data is about the PNAD 2009-19. So we said before yeah, what the pandemic found in Brazil, found in Brazil about inequality and regional and race inequality. Don't have doubt about race here. We have this data. Even the, inside the region, you have racial inequality as well. But it's very important to, to and the connection between education, regional inequality and race. Um, so the effect of this, the next question of, of our project is trying to figure it out what's happened during the pandemic. So we, we're trying to use the PNAD COVID to understand how the racial inequalities affect the available resources and the chances to face the pandemic. I don't have time to present more data. So I select just one to show, show you about the proportion of the students who receive home activities according to the region and educational level. Uh, here, the numbers are better because Pinati COVID didn't select, didn't collect uh, public and private separated. So they put together public and private school because in Brazil it's a very, very, uh, proxy for quality, proxy for inequality, uh, the, pro, uh, the private school, they have much more resources and resources and a very important way to find inequality in Brazil, especially in the elementary school and the high school. Uh, but here we have both private and public school. Again, the situation uh, during the pandemic for North and Northeast in Brazil is continuous, very, very challenging situation for these two regions. And when you have a massive black and brown population. So, uh, so that's, uh, I just have the, some examples about education, but we have the same situation for so as I said before, there is a combination of these two questions, the, the racial inequality before the pandemic and the, the racial inequality during the pandemic. But uh, it's a very important when we look at the situation before, but we cannot underestimate the effects of the categories race, gender, and territory in producing new inequalities during the pandemic. Distance education, the situation of domestic workers in Brazil during the pandemic, equal, equal health treatment, even the public system, discrimination in the labor market, who loses or who keeps their job during the pandemic are defined by categorical inequalities. And two, I'm going, that's the, People working from home during the pandemic by gender race, most of them are, 
have higher education. That's the, the that's the, the the scenario of the privileged people because they have condition to work at home. Most of them have um, pri uh, higher education. Even these people have, of course, white people have more higher education than black people, but we can find a difference between black and white uh, considering the access to, uh, in Brazil, you say home working, but the people who work for home during the pandemic is very different. Even if you consider everybody have, has uh, a higher education, that's a very, uh, the access to better conditions to work during the pandemic is a very, very different for black and white women and men in this process. So I don't have final remarks, but I have just a preliminary remarks and I'm going to take uh, uh, the last remarks from Pedro, from, from Pedro about the institutional matters. And I think the political policies matters to understand what's going on here. So, so during the years before the pandemic, so, the social policy changes increased the cost for blacks and the poor during the COVID crisis. This change also led to a higher cost for the same group. And in the post pandemic, we don't, I'm not, I'm not going to address nothing about the post pandemic. It is, I'm, I'm just put for the debate. Not only the death, but the effects of the disease among the most, uh, uh, most vulnerable people will have the long last consequence. And also there is a very important question we need to think about it. What is the structure for the, the, the health public system to deal with the impact of the pandemic? And the black population is the people who most depend on the, the public system in Brazil. Also, uh, I think the, everybody knows uh, racial inequality in Brazil may grow again. So, the little achievement we have in the last few years, the few decades, especially um, not only about the affirmative action, but the social policy in general, we will lose in a few years. So we, we, the, we, it took, we took two decades to improve the, the, the racial equality. Now we're gonna lose this in a few years. So. The scenario is not good for racial inequality the next few years. I think it is. Thank you so much. Okay, Marcia, thank you so much. It was a very nice presentation. And actually, I have a list of questions to ask you. <laughs> I, was, I was taking notes and so many things I would like to ask that I, have, I don't really know where to begin with. I just would like to uh, remind the viewers from home that we are taking questions um, on YouTube. So if you would like to ask anything, please do so. We, we do already have some questions, so I'm trying to, I'll try to organize this a little bit and try to, you know, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions, but I'll try to select some. And, um, you know, I made this huge list of questions that I would like to begin with, with a single one. And I also have questions for Pedro. So I'll try to do some of, a, you know, let each of you uh, answer one question at a time. And you showed to me very clearly that uh, this um, pandemic is actually a syndemic in the sense that uh, it interacts with the COVID interacts with all the pre-existing conditions, you know, in terms of health, but also socially determined, uh, social determinants of health that end up having results in the health of, of people. And uh, so my question to you is, what should we be looking at researching now or should be preparing to research in order to prepare for the next pandemic or the next pandemic now i don't know about, about a pandemic but the <laughs> next pandemic because <laughs> issues for a new epidemic are well the conditions for a new pandemic are also set but the yeah, conditions for a new epidemic are are 100 you know set a it, it is very likely that we're going to have a very large scale crisis within the next 20 years so maybe we should start be preparing now. And that's, that's my question to you. What should we be researching and looking at and preparing and maybe, I don't know, redesigning our policies, whatever comes to your mind since you have been studying this, this issue, please. Okay. 
No, Joe, we'll have a question for. No, no, just, just please answer this one. Then I'm... I think my public health system have policies for. We have a, a very, very interesting program for black for black population. The health system. I, I can't translate now the Programa Integral de Saúde para a População Negra, integral program, full program for black population. Um, also, we have uh, the very, very interesting, we have uh, one of our newsletter is about the, the difference between the people who live in the, the periphery, how much time they took to access the, the structure of the health in Brazil. Uh, if you think, if we think about health, you know, I, I think the consequence of the COVID-19 for the families, I think that's a very, very, I'm very, very concerned about, about this. So the structure of the family affected by COVID-19 COVID, COVID today for not only about the disease, but, uh, the, but all of the labor, the unemployment, the income, and the structure of the territory, considering the access to health conditions, to the idea of mobility, how long they take to access the structure of the public services. And we have policies in Brazil. We need to make this policy work in Brazil. I think that's, that's, that's urgent, you know, like we need to back to maybe <laughs> 10 years ago and make this, this policy work, I think. It's easy, they're not, that they are easy answer for you. Uh, we need to change the government. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you so much. I also have a question for Pedro and actually I have more than one again, but uh, I'll try to focus in one single question. And uh, I like very much your presentation. And actually, I think that, uh, Pedro, uh, that your studies on, about long-term inequality in Brazil, they are a landmark in, in our studies of economic history. And I'll say this because we had a fairly good um, history of the, of, of the production in Brazil. So we, we knew a lot about how things were being produced, what how it was being produced. It was, it was pretty much like... Um, we had an idea of the, the macroeconomics of production, but we didn't have a history of distribution. And that's why I think your studies are a landmark because they give us the perspective of the distribution in the Brazilian economic history. And my question goes in that direction. We have some knowledge about the production side of the Brazilian economy before the 1930s. You know, there was previous studies have already shown that. But what do we know about the distribution side of the Brazilian economy before the 1930s? And this is perhaps the motivating question, but I, my, my, the questions that I actually have are, how important would it be to know more about the distribution side of the Brazilian economy before the 1930s? What lessons we may be, one, you know, be willing to, to take studying that. And also, if we are to study that, what questions should we be asking? Please. Just it. <laughs> yeah. Simple, simple Marcel, easy, easy. Marcelo only asks easy questions. Uh, that, that's actually very good. I think that's uh, the great challenge right now, I'd say, uh, finding out what was happening uh, in this country, especially in the second half of the 19th century, and then uh, early decades of the 20th century. There's, there's been some work, some very good work on this using data that is still very sparse. Uh, for instance, uh, a bunch of people, very good people uh, have used the 1872 census and tried to build uh, a, a social table, the so-called social table. So you study inequality, looking at the occupational categories and then trying to get wage data from other sources. Some people have used uh, the voter lists, the, and I'm not sure what, what they called exactly, but since you had to, to have a certain income threshold to be allowed to vote, uh, the voter lists usually, uh, and, and this was very, not as restrictive as it sounds, but 
so there's this local voter list, but uh, I think most papers on that are still related to specific localities or specific states. A, a bunch of work has been done on Rio Grande do Sul. And I think we, we, it's, it's, it's great stuff that's been going on. And, and elsewhere in Latin America as well, have been trying to uncover or to find, you know, going to national archives and stuff like that to try to find any kind of information, even from newspapers, if, if that's uh, where information on wages, and the population is uh, to try to put together at least some some estimates, however rough they might be, uh, but they're, they're, they're sure to be informative. And the kind of questions we want to look at, well, most people try to, to look at the effects of uh, the first so-called first globalization in, in the southern cone. So uh, Argentina has been studied a lot because well, it's a country that was uh, quite rich by international standards at, at that point in time and seeing how it affected uh, the income distribution. Uh, so we could do the same for Brazil, certainly, like the, the rise of coffee, of all coffee exports, and the railroads in Sao Paulo, sure. Uh, there's a, Whedon Summerhill has a, a fantastic book on the economic impact of railroads. It would be interesting to see also the distributional impact, if that could be, if that could be done. And of course, as Marcia said, and, and I cannot uh, agree more with her, uh, regional inequalities and, and within region as well is something we need to look into. And uh, most people try to, at least recently, try to explain, you know, regional inequality in Brazil as a matter of human capital or maybe transportation costs uh, and geographic barriers between regions. And I think we could look at that more closely as well. So, and of course, I mean, there's just th this one difficulty that I have, th this one issue I have difficulty with, and I don't want to talk too much, so feel free to interrupt me, but uh, there's one issue I have difficulty with, and it's, it's conceptual really, uh, which is, does it make sense to look at income inequality like we always do in a society where, I don't know, 10% of the population is still in captivity, is still enslaved? I mean, uh, most people, when they look at societies where slavery was, you know, uh, an important issue, they, they either ignore the slave population, the slave population entirely, or they just try to ascribe to them like a, a subsistence wage. And both alternatives kind of feel strange to me, like slavery is such a dramatic and categoric form of inequality that's so different. Can we even conceive of income inequality in, in modern terms in society where slavery still exists? So there's a, a something at the conceptual level that I think I, I'd like to, you know, know more about it and, and think harder through this. And I think that's something that needs to be faced if we're going to look back at the 19th century, because I, I feel it's just like a, a completely different form of social stratification that cannot be re easily reconciled with, you know, modern. Uh, the modern uh, debate on income inequality. So uh, I'd like also to say that I, I agree 100% with pretty much everything Marcia said. And uh, I think it's very important to have those complementary perspectives on inequality, looking just like it generally more abstractly, but also in terms of, of race and region in Brazil, and, and I think gender obviously too, but those are uh, crucial you know, uh, dimensions of inequality in this country. Okay, um, I'm gonna. Uh, people are asking questions, so I'd like to begin asking some questions, like presenting the questions to you. First, we had a question from Tomas Fujiwara, and that question is for Marcia. And Marcia, do you believe that there are already big impacts from COVID 19 on gender gaps on income, meaning women leaving the labor force? Do you believe this will have lasting consequences? You know, the, the impacts of COVID-19 on gender gaps. Impact of the gender gaps in the COVID? Yeah, the, yeah gender, gender imp, the gender impacts of COVID-19, and particularly in the labor market, especially women la leaving the labor force. And from, that's my dog. That's my <laughs> other dog. <laughs> Those are two dogs. Those are my two dogs barking. Please, could you please stop barking? <laughs> then we have a question for, from uh, Jean Wilmer Alexandre. And uh, the question is, what is the percentage of those considered white in Brazil? Brazil appears to be more integrated than the USA in the racial inequality. I mean, is the racial inequality a consequence of racial discrimination? 
I suppose, in case of Brazil. And we have also a question for, from uh, João Biel from the Brazil lab and also from Marcia. Would it be great to get your thoughts on political pathways today, national and regional, to possibly address systemic racism? Yeah, that's for, that's for you. Then I'm going to ask... You repeat the la- can you repeat the last one from John, please? Uh, no, John is just saying that it would be great to get your thoughts on political pathways today, both uh, national and regional, to possibly address uh, the problem of systemic racism. Okay. And I'll let you answer those questions in a, you know, in a bunch, then we can move to Pedro. Okay. Please feel free to answer them. I'm just trying to find um, a graph here to the So I'm gonna to, I'm going to change the order of the question and while I'm trying to find... Well, you can't, you can't um, answer all of them in a, in a single package. I think it would be easier for you. That's why I asked them. In a, okay. I, it's, it's your decision. You just don't, don't feel... No, I want to I wanna show a graph, but I, I was uh, very confused with this, <laughs> with this thing. Um, okay. So is the racial equality and racial discrimination, that's the, that question is always a very, very um, a trick question. Yes, racial discrimination is produce racial inequalities. And we have uh, several studies uh, looking into this, this question, especially when you look at, for example, people on higher education and especially social mobility and higher education, we can figure it out how, uh, for example, education is a, the, the best way to explain that because when you have people, educated people, black, white and black educated people, we always figure it out more, more income, better position, for example, for uh, white people than black people. So. Of course, there is a combination um, between race and class in Brazil. But as I said about the regional inequality, it's not a coincidence. So the, the trajectory of the black and white people to, to access education, to live in the better conditions, it's about discrimination. So we, don't, we can't find a specific time when discrimination become inequality. So it's a process. It's a our process. It is, it's a very, very combina- combination of process. For example, uh, the, the, the discrimination during the, uh, the school, in, into the school, and the discrimination in the education the learning process. It's a very, very hard to for the black people stay in the, at the schools, for example. This is the most, the most powerful way to produce racial inequalities in the education, not the, the performance of the black students. They always are considered uh, stupid and violent. So the stereotypes during the education process is a kind of a way you, you can understand okay. how racism and racial discrimination produce racial inequality. The impact of gender, and there is a, I think that's the most powerful impact of gender and race in, in, during the pandemic is, is about care. So uh, the, during the pandemic, the situation of the black woman, is the, the woman in general, but the, the black woman impact about the care of the children and the care inside the, the home. They, 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 I'm, I lost my, my graph about this. But it's a very, very, uh, the difference between white, uh, the men and women, for example, the proportion of the women who give up on find a, a, a job or in, during the pandemic because they, they, they must stay at home to take care of family, take care of kids, especially take care of the elder people is very, is higher, much, much higher than, than men. So there is a lot of impact of gender, gender and race 
in, in the labor markets. The another one is the situation of the, the domestic workers. That's a huge impact for the black woman, especially because, for example, for the black woman in the domestic works, more than half percent of the domestic work in Brazil, they are responsible for their, their household family. So they, they have a very, very important play in the, the domestic budget. So it's a very the impact for the family, not only for the, the women, but the, the, the structure of the family. João, I think that's it's a very, very, I think I'm talking about systemic and the, the idea of structural racism and systemic racism. It's about how you understand the, the, the role of the combination of regional and the idea of the regional and race in Brazil. It, we can't understand, as I told you before, and Pedro said, uh, we can't, it's a historical decision, it's a historical process how black population is this, uh, the distribution of the black population in Brazil for me is uh, the best picture of the systemic racism in Brazil. And how the black population in Brazil, yeah, the distribution of the black population in the cities in Brazil is the result of the systemic racism in Brazil. So I think that's my short answer for this very complicated questions. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I have a question for Pedro now. And the question comes from João Biel, who's asking many questions today. And he begins saying, um, for Pedro, not asking, you, not asking you to do astrology. And then he moves <laughs> on and asks you to do astrology. And then he continues, but I would like, it would be great to get some of your thoughts on the economic rationality or irrationality of the current populist government or reframing his question in, which is also a question I have is what's the future of inequality in Brazil? Uh, I always forget to unmute. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. That's, that's a very good question. I think, uh, uh, let's see, it, it might be actually easier to, to just speculate on the future of inequality because it's probably going to be very grim, very bleak. I, I'd expect inequality to, to increase. Inequality was already on, on, the, on the upswing since the recession. Uh, the day, all the data I showed stopped in uh, 2015, 16 at most. But what we had back then was just like a massive recession and the recovery really only uh, benefited the, the rich. Uh, pretty much all income growth since 2015 accrued to the top, to, to, the, to, uh, to the upper half of the population. So the, the poorest, the, the poorest, the bottom 50% really uh, didn't see anything really, just didn't get anything. So uh, as, as I say, the pandemic hit Brazil at the worst possible moment, I would say, because we're just coming in, into a very weak recovery after a massive recession and then came came this pandemic so it's it's very likely and as marcel was saying i mean the, the early data we have shows that the pandemic hit the poorest the hardest so especially the black population and you know the self-employed and, and you know, informal uh, wage workers as we call them uh, in the north, in the northeast, so you'd expect inequality to increase at least. Uh, and it's very hard to see a quick recovery out of this. It's very hard to see a wholesale uh, change in how uh, the government uh, allocates its budget. So uh, we are actually right now. It's been a huge controversy, but because we're really counting pennies, trying to redesign Bolsa Familia, trying to increase its budget, which is already. Uh, way behind it was falling in real terms for almost a decade so we're trying to actually all this talk about improving bolsa familia really means making bolsa familia as large as it was in real terms eight to, to ten years ago or, or seven to eight years ago so it's not it's good it's it's important it's better than what we have obviously and it's it's some improvement it's some improvement but it's it's not going to be enough uh, uh to you know uh, trying to stem this tide of rising inequality. 
And I think, uh, the, any, I mean, I refrain from commenting on, on this government in particular for obvious reasons, but uh, I'll say that anyone who, you know, if we had presidential elections tomorrow, anyone who would come into, into office would be facing a, a major challenge insofar as, uh, well, uh, there's no, uh, I mean, the budget is in deficit for, you know, I think it's seven, eight percent at this point, maybe more, uh, even if you ignore the, the extra spending we had this year. So there's no really, there's no money left to uh, you know, try to spend big and spend our way out of this recession. At the same time, we have rising inequality, rising poverty rates, and it's very clear that we need to do more for the poorest half of the population. And that includes all the informal workers, all those workers, and that's mostly the black population, as Marcel was saying, they are very vulnerable to any kind of negative shock. So uh, obviously a pandemic is like the greatest shock of all, but you know, uh, disease, local downturns in economic activity, stuff like this, th th there's a huge segment of the population that's very vulnerable and our social protection system does not protect them at all at this point. And we need to change that. And it's clear that, uh, I mean, the, this is as clear to everybody as Marcia said, but the pandemic made some politicians at least, even some politicians on, on the right, surprisingly, uh, very conscious of this, so so it's 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 really a dilemma. I mean, uh, and you need in, in these situations you need strong po political leadership and people who know what you're doing uh, to try you know to navigate their way out of this of this crisis. But in any case, I would expect inequality to increase and then to remain high for at least you know, another decade or so. I was just presenting uh, some work earlier today on on how the, the 2010 this decade we just finished was another last decade for Brazil economically and socially. I mean, all the social indicators are just as bad as they were in 2010 or maybe even worse. So uh, we're really treading water or maybe even uh, going back. And of course, the pandemic hit, so we have to work hard to make sure this decade won't turn out like that too. And uh, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. I'm, I'm pessimistic by nature, but at this point, I feel, I feel kind of vindicated, you know. Uh, because uh, it's not, it's, it's, it, it worries me a lot, really. Okay, no, you know, you're very good at, at astrology, so maybe you should be thinking about, you know, changing your profession to a more mm. stable and, you know, one. Considering um, our situation as a professor and a researcher, that's not, that's not a good, <laughs> bad idea. <Yeah. laughs> well, we, never, we never know those things. <laughs> So to, to conclude the seminar, I would like to thank both of you, uh, Marcia and Pedro, for your participation today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And I would like to thank uh, the viewers from home. Thank you so much as well for watching us. We hope we'll participate in the future Brazil Lab events. We have a Twitter account. Uh, we tweet those events. We also have a website and you just Google it and you're going to find the Brazil Lab website. As a final note and a heads up, uh, the next week, we will host a online event featuring Tasso Azevedo. The title of the event is Amazonia on Fire, Revealing Ecosystem Transformations and Jeez. Threats with Science and Transparency. And the event will have our own Michael Celia and João Biel as discussant and moderator. So thank you very much and see all of you very soon. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.